right, guys. Welcome to the uh, third episode of the River City Labs podcast, Makers on Tap. This will technically be a supplementary episode since we're not really sure how it's going to go, but it is the third thing we've recorded together. Woo. So tonight we are in the new River City Labs. This is the first day we've had keys. Woo-woo. And a couple of us have been here since very early this morning, removing a whole lot of stuff and uh, making a whole a huge mess into a pretty clean space that's going to be a clean slate for us to move into. So this is Joe. This is Aaron. And this is Christian. And this is Josh. And Jay is here. New people. New people on the podcast. And then we have people that don't want to talk, but they're probably going to talk behind us anyway. So, you know, if you hear them, ignore them. And we're not necessarily in the cleanest of audio spaces either. So we're recording on new equipment, new mics, and in a completely new space. So if the audio is meh compared to the last couple of weeks, give us a break. All right. (laughs) So, uh, our normal podcast flow is we figure out what we're drinking, and uh, tonight I'm drinking from our new neighbors, Industry Brewing. I'm looking at their sign out our new bay door, uh, the, uh, crap, oh, Sunday Sidekick, Hefeweizen, and uh, I the Crowler, and I'm like three quarters of the way through it, so this is going to be a fun podcast. Yeah, so for those of you who don't know what a crowler is, it's a can-based growler. It it's is a, a it's a quart. One quart of beer <laughs> in an oversized aluminum can. It's a good flow. <laughs> Mine, mine's empty. <laughs> My second one's halfway gone. Oh. What kind did you get? I got the Got Room, which is their peanut butter stout. And they gave me a huge stink about it. They're like, oh, well, we don't normally put this in a crowler because it's only good for that night. And I'm like, well, no worries. It's going to be gone tonight. <laughs> right. I ended up getting, I guess they have a rotating cider that they that they go through. And, uh, man, this is one of the hardest ciders that I've ever had. <laughs> it's uh, It'll definitely put you out there. That's for sure. What's it a cider out of? Uh, I don't know. They like uh, they were so busy at the time. I was just like rotating cider, put it in a crowler. <laughs> I have a uh, Goose Island three one two today. Um, one thing I just noticed looking at the label is they, they get their hops from Elk Mountain Farm. So I don't know if that makes it better or not. Oh, Elk Mountain. Oh. This is usually Elk oh, yeah. Mountain. Yeah, yeah, I haven't yeah. been there. My go-to thing when I'm going for something <laughs> super special, I go Goose three one two. At least it's still semi-local. Yeah, you know, it's still still Chicago, still semi-local beer. So uh, yeah, and then our, our yeah, our, we're really excited about industry. I'm not sure industry is excited about us yet, but they're gonna. They, be. Will, they will be. be. There's gonna be so much beer here from them. We have but, six. We have six cans after tonight. Woo. Yeah. So our goal is by the end of the year was that the discussion I yeah i think so our uh one of our walls will be up to our hvac ducts and industry crowlers which i, I think is an easy goal <laughs> i don't think it's <laughs> a stretch goal i'm gonna say that's 34 feet of cans <laughs> oh oh up to the up to the duct work? No, no no from the from the block wall out angle to the duct work oh okay and that wall. We could use some Third. Velcro strips to Velcro the cans on the wall. <laughs> <laughs> excellent, excellent. It's definitely going to be interesting. <laughs> it, it's, it's still not a stretch goal. I'm, I'm looking at it. We're going to be fine. Um, I like so, Jay's idea, though. <laughs> <laughs> so our next, uh, our next thing has always been maker news. Um, so there were a couple of maker news topics that we had, but the one that I'm super geeked about, did you guys watch the Q&A for the tool changer yesterday? yesterday? Not at all. I, I didn't get to. All right, so uh, E3D live streamed a, a Q and A session for the Tool Changer. Um, that was on Facebook, right? It, well, I, it was on YouTube. Oh. Uh, because you know that's where we you know, live stream things. Uh, but it, it was really fun to watch. I'm worried about it though. 
I, I'm worried about the Tool Changer project as a project, and not because of E3D, but because of the public's blatant misunderstanding of what they are trying to accomplish with this project. And we talked about it a little bit last week where they are working on doing the Tool Changer machine as a technology demo and not, not, I, I can't emphasize this enough, not an off the shelf tool changing or color changing or multi-tool head or multi-color 3D printer. When you buy this thing, it will not work without you putting a significant amount of effort into it. It is a technology platform that is meant to be built upon for research projects. Well, and I think this was the difficult thing because immediately when I heard this in the podcast, I was like, whoa, this sounds awesome. And I was excited about it because I was like, we can get that and maybe I can even put it on my own printer and that would be awesome to have. And so I can totally see where like, yeah, no, this is exciting technology, but maybe they're not putting it out there as clearly. It sounds well, like a marketing problem. They're, they're being well, pretty clear. It's a very strong problem of people aren't listening <laughs> They're hearing what they want to hear. So people don't do that. Is it a similar approach to their cr- uh, Crimea or Chimera? The you saw the tool changer at at Murph. Oh yeah, the the that four thing. tool heads. Yeah. Okay, that's sort of the problem. Is they have been bringing this very beautifully working machine to trade shows and showing people like, look, we can make these beautiful four color prints, or or various infill prints or whatever. Um, but you know, right after that, they say if you buy this, it's going to be a mach- it's a mechanical platform. It's not a printer. So the people ever stop it listening be at, at the if I if they, yeah they they <laughs> they don't they can't see past what they're seeing, and um, they talked on YouTube for an hour, and I've never seen Sanjay get frustrated before. Well, I saw Sanjay get frustrated um, because people just couldn't seem to get it. it. Multiple people posted, like, will this be a, a finished product that I can buy? And, uh, you know, how many colors can I print with this product? Or um, is it going to be an easy thing to change tool heads between 0.25 and a 0.4 nozzle? And, you know, Sanjay and Greg, I I think they handled it as good as they could. They just kept going, yes, but you'll have to put in the work. Um, You know, you'll have to buy the Duet Electronics. You'll have to buy the tool heads. You'll have to buy all of the components to make all of that work. If you buy the tool, the base tool changer mechanical platform, it's not going to be a printer as such. It's, this is a ecosystem that you have to put some work into. It's not... Stars align. Yeah. This, yeah. So I'm worried about the future of the project because the public doesn't seem to get it. They don't get many things. Do you think this is something where it's like only, only the entrepreneurs are not getting it? Or do you think that the um, people who are actually like engineers who are actually working on this stuff they get it it's just the people who are trying to make a quick buck off this i think um i think there's a fundamental understanding or fundamental misunderstanding of how these machines work throughout the community still um and the people that see these machines that are asking these questions are the people that have been told by people like me for a number of years now, maybe you shouldn't do dual extrusion because that's a really, really difficult problem to solve and it just doesn't work very well out of the box. Sure. Um, Or maybe you shouldn't shoot for dissolvable supports because it's a very difficult problem to solve and it just doesn't work very well out of the box. And that's why machines like the Stratasys machines that cost $50,000 that have dissolvable supports out of the box, they work. Because they cost $50,000 and they have that level of support and engineering and uh, development behind them. They're not relying on an open source community to come in and back in some of this stuff. That's not to say that this machine won't work if you put the effort into it. It very much will. It's absolutely beautiful. Um, But the, uh, 
the software side still has a huge hurdle to jump. And um, the, even the firmware side still has a pretty big hurdle to jump. Yeah. Uh, but the Duet guys have done a very good job of getting it close. So, and, and that's that's purely what this is about, is a, uh, we, we built this machine, now let's build this support. So it's very much DIY, yeah. at a high level DIY, and you have high technical skills, but yet the average 3D printer is not going to be able to consume this. It, the problem has been the, the very low barrier to entry printers like the CR10 and the Enders have lowered the barrier to entry to the community significantly. So the people like us that are really interested in digging into the mechanics of the machine and spending a lot of time to make these machines work are dwindling and moving on to other projects that aren't aren't so... 3D printer-ish? Well, you know, it's, it's just Not like so a... Not so single nozzle-ish. Yeah. Not so single nozzle-ish. <laughs> I, I think it's kind of become like uh, underground music. You know, I, I always had friends in high school that were like, oh, the, they would listen to a band until they got on the radio, and then that band sucked. Jay, and, or, Joe, are you saying that we are the hipsters of 3D printers? <laughs> Is that what you were just labeling us as? <laughs> we're not, because we're still working on it. Joe's saying he was a hipster before the term hipster was coined. <laughs> I do have a curly mustache. Drink that. That's fair. <laughs> but, um, you know, we, we are still working hard to develop this stuff. We haven't moved on past it because it's still interesting yeah it's still very interesting yes yeah. and we're not moving away from it because yeah. the masses have have infiltrated now our attention span may span months at a time but yeah we still come back yeah so <laughs> more news uh, other maker news slack was down for an hour this week i about died <laughs> <laughs> josh why do, why do we keep relying on a centralized chat platform that we don't control because hangouts still sucks when it comes to a centralized chat platform that in the masses didn't really work too well no and it didn't. we don't Holy crap. and we don't want to support microsoft but what but what, teams what is so good but what about yeah. moving to a non-centralized chat platform that works very much like Slack, like, like Rocket Riot? Chat, or Riot, or, Riot, yeah. or Mattermost, <laughs> or... We said the same thing. Be, the <laughs> because there's only maybe three people at the Makerspace that want to focus on that, and they have 3D printers to focus on that with, multi, with multi-printing platform capabilities. So... Ryan, if you're listening to this, make sure Slack doesn't ever go down again, okay? <laughs> <laughs> that kind of rolls into a topic I want to talk about in a different episode, which is, you know, what should the, what kind of role should the makerspace play in its members' lives? Should it just be a tool shop, or should it, because we're so knowledgeable, should we be setting a technological example for others to follow? That's kind of one thing I would just like to explore in a different episode, but... Oh boy! That, 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 yeah, that. no. Oh, all I'm thinking is man. like this is going to be the <laughs> only <laughs> so fun. Oh, Jay, you're coming to that one. <laughs> Am I allowed to be there? there? <laughs> sure. Other maker news. Lulzbot. Lulzbot yeah. lied to yeah. us. Oh. <laughs> they said they were giving us an SLA printer, and then they gave us a incredibly precise nozzle on a really excellent printer. <laughs> it, Those yeah. jerks <laughs> it's giving us easier uh, options to the things that we don't actually want. It's great because another uh, 3D printing journalist website actually picked up the teaser video and actually went ahead and published saying, oh, here, Lulzbot teased their new SLA printer and they bit the onion, for those who know <laughs> what biting the onion means. Yeah. But why... why why would Lulzbot do that to us? Why would they? Why would they pull at our heartstrings and then take it away? Did they actually say SLA no. in their advertisement? No, but they said that we're laser focused and we're on and the that will spectrum. Cure, we will cure this need in the community, <laughs> as all SLA prints need to be cured. Because they know that we cannot get mad at Lulzbot. We can. No. Yeah, no, I mean, that just that just really <laughs> sounds like some, we know the community, and we're just going to mess with you guys, and then we're going to make up for it. <laughs> but I, I think it brings up a really good point, because so many people come to us, and they're like, uh, I don't really want to do that kind of printer, because it can't do that kind of resolution, or it can't, it's not good enough. But, like, 
I'm going to poke you, Jay, because you've probably spent the most time trying to get an SLA working out of all of us. Why? Why would I want to... I've poked you, go. So I I don't know what your question is, but um, I don't know. The resin printers, it did good when it did good, but there was a lot of fussing with it, a lot of a lot of chemicals and cleaning up and I hear that and all toxic that material stuff. is edible. Yeah. The resin. <laughs> yeah. You could eat it. You just won't. I'm just, if survive. I go anywhere near it, even if I don't touch it, I start tasting it, which <laughs> is why I stopped using it. Have you become one with the SLA? <laughs> <laughs> the SLA has been sitting for about seven months Yeah, without anybody using yeah, it. For good reason. Like uh, SLA prints are super messy. It, it's a vat of, of UV curable resin. And a little display will cure individual layers, which is what gives you your layers in the print. But that resin itself is, you know, highly toxic, and it's anytime like it's exposed to it, it starts to cure. So you got to clean the prints as soon as they come out. You got to clean the build plate as soon as it comes out, or else it, the resin will cure to the plate. It becomes a whole ordeal. You got to wear gloves. It's super messy and it's a huge hassle. But if you can manage that. I- Great I, I think my, my biggest problem with it, I could get over all that other stuff and come up with processes. My biggest problem is it takes about an hour, two hours for the plate to actually come out of the resin so I can peek at it just to see if the thing stuck to the bed. And 75% <laughs> oh. of the time it started peeling or it didn't stick to the bed. Oh, yeah. And I'm not, I mean, I'm sure I could tweak it a lot more, but I just didn't have the time. And uh, we just didn't have the members that were pushing me to do it. So, Man, I wanted to print a chess set. Well, you still can. It's at the makerspace, but this is the point. Josh wanted to print a chess set, and I've never seen him afraid to touch anything at the space. <laughs> the only time I've ever seen the cover taken off the SLA is when Jay's been messing with it and that weird little week when uh, Aaron tried to get Monkey Print to work on Linux. That was a hassle. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That was, those were my, my points. As soon as that video came out, I was like, they're not teasing SLA. There's no way. They're, they're pushing this as a quality leap in FDM. I mean, by definition, it was a tease. It was. And... Uh, that was trolling. <laughs> <laughs> trolling in the whole industry. Yeah. And I, say, I, I was we, actually kind of mad at them because I was really excited to deconstruct that SLA video during this podcast. I know. And uh, I... I, I for, for people that don't know, I used to work at Lulzbot, so I, as soon as the reveal video came out, I was like, I thought you guys said mid-September to w- one of my friends that works on the marketing team. And uh, he, uh, he was like, yeah, but it was good, wasn't it? <laughs> <laughs> and it was, it, until you started to deconstruct the video, and he looked at the wooden dowel and the aquarium, and the mm. there, were, there were a lot of gives, but... Well, I feel like SLA takes a special type of person to want to do it because even at the trade like even you talk about trade shows and you even rep rap like everybody's like oh that's so cool but yes that, yet everybody goes back to their fb uh, you know you really need to be dedicated to it yeah, yeah. yeah. well any like i think about like us like i crowdsourced it like our sla printer who Jay, who of us that crowdsourced it really actually used it? Right, right. nobody. Yeah, no Jay? Bad. Oh, no, you did. <laughs> well, yeah. yeah. I used it just to prove that it works, and then I brought it to the space, and nobody said, show me how to use it. So there's been, a, there's been a, like, maybe one or two members came in, made a little couple pieces or whatever, and then they went back to the, to the regular printers. Um, and, and I think it brings up a good point about makerspaces in general and the way we run our makerspace. What we do at the space is based off of what the membership wants to do. And, you know, we, we kind of bought, it, bought into this ahead before the, makers, the members were actually asking us for it. We thought we could buy it and people would get use out of it, and we were wrong. So, you know, lost a little bit of money because it just sits there as an yeah. a anchor somewhere. We, in did, we didn't lose shop. any money. We, yeah, it's crowdsourced. So. Yeah, I think crowd that eventually source. there is going to come somebody who is going to use it, and we'll get use out of it. I don't think that having a tool in a makerspace is ever going to be seen as lost money, because somehow it will be used. Well, yeah, and, but and, and, and maybe lost money is the wrong way of putting it. it it's it, money we put towards something that 
Misplaced. Now we can't put towards something else. Yeah, it's misplaced. We're, we're going to end up putting maintenance on that machine before we'll probably ever, like, we're going to put maintenance on it because, like, time is going to cause maintenance, not because of usage causing maintenance. <laughs> but, you know, yeah. that kind of leads us into our, our next thing, which is makerspace operations. Uh, what a good segue. Segways are hard. Segways are so well. hard. Um, <laughs> next topic. Next topic. But, <laughs> you know, um, we're, we're all super excited to be in this space, which is why we're recording this podcast here, so we could kind of capture this amazement of, like, hey, See, feels like we made it. Uh, <laughs> but um, I vote Joe doesn't sing anymore. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, no, that's a that's a an inside joke. Which I actually got congratulated the other day that we didn't do any inside jokes on the uh, thing. It's an inside joke that none of you will participate in except for you, which you aren't even in to make the podcast. Jerk. Um, <laughs> that's that Ted, by the, the way. Listeners. <laughs> um, <laughs> but. You know, in this new space, it's going to allow us to do easier cleanup areas. Like we have one spot in our current space that has access to water, and that space is kind of difficult to get to. Um, so anytime you have to do anything close to it with water, you have to probably move some stuff, right? And uh, the water access is eh. uh, The hot water is kind of meh. So... Um, when we do something like SLA that does require a wash down at the end, nobody wants to do it because it's a pain. And I, I think getting into this new space that has, I could count like four different water access areas in this space and our 3D printing area is going to be next to a wash down sink. We may actually see an, an uptick in usage of things like that and our screen printing stuff that was uh, donated by Muddy Water Press last year that hasn't been used a ton. It's been used a little, but not a ton. Um, it, th those are the things that like, I'm very excited for this space with. I think, I think we should put the SLA printer next to the uh, utility sink. Yeah, that's I mean, kind of what sense. we were hinting at. Josh. Oh, okay. All Welcome right, to cool. the conference. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, I think um, with this new space, like, because we... Um, before, if you ever had the opportunity to come out to the space, I was split between two floors, uh, and there was a very large staircase, and it made it hard for some members to be able to get in and out of, um, whereas this new space that we're moving into is completely on one floor, it's all cement floor, and it's going to be very accessible to anybody who wants to be able to come in for it, and it's just really, everybody has kind of, I've seen myself, regain that spark of creativity of like this is going to be awesome we're going to get into a space where we can start creating again well and i look at where we started a hundred square or hundred square foot room closet closet closet, closet. <laughs> yeah, should we tell the, tell the story of the progression of the space real quick. I, yeah real quick condensed I, version yeah. so yeah, a condensed version. I, I, I get lengthy on this. But yeah, we started in a... Uh, so we started, before Josh even started, we started in my garage. And then we were roving once a month to each other's garages until our wives said, you can't do this anymore. Because um, the original group was like six. And um, it, by the time our wives were telling us we can't do this anymore, we were at about 15. And that was right around the time Josh started. And um, at that point, one of our members had rented a space in a uh, art studio that was about 100 square feet. And he, was orig he originally rented it for his own projects. And then he was like, okay, I'll, the makerspace should have this. They need it more than I do. At that same point, we got donated about 20 grand in equipment oh from a local business. Um, that was awesome and sucked at the same time. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. thank you. Uh, that was uh, Probotics that donated that stuff to us. They make incredible CNC routers, and they're still big supporters of River City Labs. So I, check them out. I want to pause you for a second. If um, anybody listening to the podcast would like a bearing, um, <laughs> please send your name and email and shipping address to officers at rivercitylabs.space. Thank you very much. This offer is only good for one week. Otherwise, they're all going to be gone regardless. Yeah. So we got donated a pallet of bearings. Um, and we're still getting rid of them years later. And uh, about 
Eight months after that, we moved into 400 square feet in the same art studio. But that art studio's landlord was great, and he let us kind of spill out into the common area of the studio after 5 p.m. business hours. So we were able to do uh, community nights and classes and show and tells and events, um, even though we only had between 100 and 400 square feet in the space. We were able to do a lot. And then after that, we moved into our current space, which is uh, in the warehouse district as well. Um, and we have like 2,000-ish. Maybe usable, I'd say, solid 1,500. Yeah. And, uh, you know, th- that has served us incredibly well and been a huge growth milestone for us for the last two years Mm. and uh yeah we've been able to acquire a full wood shop in that time we've been able to take our hopes and dreams of making a functional makerspace and make a functional makerspace out of it um and you know go away from the whole idea of a pop-up makerspace which is how we were existing for a year and a half and uh you know people were still paying us dues and supporting our dreams then so we were definitely on to something and uh you know, now we are uh, in November. We'll be five years old from inception, that but not crazy. from um, actual birth of business. Uh, from the very first day where we all met uh, the original members, we'll be five years old, November twenty second. Um, so you know, now we're growing into how much? How many square feet? Twenty one hundred square feet with a ten by ten overhead door. Yeah. 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 yeah concrete and three-phase power and air conditioning and heat i I haven't seen one flight of stairs in the whole space yeah and (laughs) internet that we can actually have a land party yeah Yeah. and we're finally gonna have fiber optic internet all the reasons we're gonna have we're gonna have garbage service for the first time in our history oh my gosh jay i don't know what your garbage man's gonna do (laughs) (laughs) he's gonna think i moved he's gonna throw, throw a party um but you know this this is how op- this is how community makerspaces grow and operate and stay successful is we yeah. grow by our means and by our membership. So now that we're all in this brand new building, I would like to maybe we have five people around this microphone now. Maybe each go around and say what our biggest hopes and dreams are for this new space. What we would like to see come out of it. Start Oh, sure. Um, I think the biggest thing that I would love to see out of this is this space has the possibility of growth. Um, throughout the rest of the building that we're inhabiting. Uh, And so one of the things that I would love to actually see in time return, no time soon, so if you're listening to this, this is not something that is available right now, but I would love to see actually angel memberships come back uh, and actually have space for artists and makers to be able to come in and actually have devoted art space for them to be able to actually work on their projects at the space. I would love to see makers and artists at the space making stuff constantly and for the space to be constantly in use um i think that's one of my biggest things that i hope to see with the new space i would honestly say i would say first off i go back 12 years and i would say that i remember me and another person on this podcast sitting in an apartment together going we should rent the back corner of this building and have a green screen area and a video studio and a photo studio and maybe some mach- some woodworking machines and we should just live in it. <laughs> <laughs> yep. And now 12 years later, we aren't living in it, but we're, now we're married. Yeah, now we're, yeah. Exactly. Not to each other. <laughs> <laughs> but the, problem, the point is, somebody would have a say in that that would say no. But it's like, we have, it's amazing, like, to me, like, 12 years and where we've come. And I have, I have a personal attachment to this building, but still, it's like, I've seen the potential for so many years. And it's awesome to see the makerspace kind of take that next step into getting into a space that is really going to help them flourish and it gets into the expandability that Christian just talked about and stuff like that because really it's like we can be as small as we want but as big as we want all at the same time. So for me, uh, my biggest hope and dream for this space is that this new building will allow us to 
pursue other uh, avenues for revenue generation. And one of that is uh, being able to host different t- types of classes. I've seen other maker spaces um, thrive on just hosting uh, welding classes. And just those classes alone, being able to provide enough revenue for the rent alone. Uh, we, we try to do something like that at, at our current space, but because it was an old, you know, 100 year old building, wooden floors, it, it wasn't a great environment to do, you know, fiery type stuff in. But now our new building is, you know, concrete floors, whatever, so we'll be able to do more stuff like that. It's a, uh, this space is now, we, we went from two floors to now one floor with slightly more square footage. So now we have a lot more actual workable area to do all sorts of different classes now. Um, I would love to see us put some sort of framework together to actually start um, hosting classes at a, a good interval in order to you know, generate that additional revenue for the, for the space. Um, this, this new building will definitely allow us to do that. And I'm super excited to see what we come up with for that. The new location is at least perceived as much safer than the old location. Who are you? Oh, Bye-bye. yes. Yeah. <laughs> I'm, I'm Ted. Uh, Who are you, Ted? Oh. So the new location in Peoria seems to be much safer, and we've had complaints over the years of various demographics not wanting to go down into the warehouse district, namely children and Parents. other genders that we don't currently have at the Makerspace. We have some. Very much. We, we have We have, several, we have, we have some. several genders so here. I'm looking forward to <laughs> potentially balancing to that <laughs> to closer to 50-50 gender yeah. and having classes for children and that sort of thing that some people f- didn't feel comfortable with. Well, and it was amazing Thank when you, we Ted. had... Yeah, thank you, Ted. Yeah, thanks, Ted. Yeah. Thanks for joining in. Oh, my beer. It was amazing when we Party did it. it. When we announced this, like how many people came out and said, "Oh, I'm gonna tell about the kids, whatever. They're gonna, like, they're gonna love to hear this because now they're gonna want to come down here." And like that was to me, that was validation enough with the new place. Well, what was funny was we've been trying to move to this building for like two years, for a while. Three years? Three years, yeah. And uh, we kept getting pushback from people like, ah, oh, it's too far out of the way. Downtown Peoria is so centralized. And then the officers finally made a, made a decision when it, it came time. And uh, then everyone, those same people were like, oh, that's so cool that we're going to move to this space. <laughs> <laughs> so um, it really showed me that people are very indecisive. Uh, <laughs> but... Um, the I'm I'm looking forward to um, it just like like you Josh more people being in the space there and Christian more people being in the space more often and um, the space being comfortable enough to allow people to actively create and just be part of the space without all of our spaces before were either very cold or very hot and you really had to want it to be yeah. there and um, you know I to a certain extent I liked that barrier to entry and <laughs> like you know pay your dues but at the same time you gotta tough it to make it <laughs> yeah at the same time I don't because I want the space to be accessible to as many people as possible so it, it's exciting that we're going to be in a comfortable space to allow people to create. But the other thing I'm really excited about the space is there's just so much around it. Um, you know, oh, yeah. we've got industry right next to us. We've got storage units right next to us that people need to store big projects. Uh, we've got a ton of local um, businesses for, for food and for services all around us. Um, you know, there's a, there's a huge amount of life up here. Um, that I wish was more in the uh, indus- industrial district, the warehouse district that we were in, but I think this will support us to uh, grow a lot more. Um, and I'm excited that we have parking lots, so now yes. we can we can do some outdoor projects more often. Parking it's going to be easier garbage. to host events. Um, 
Midwest it, Danger Fest coming out in an undetermined amount of time. No. Yes. <laughs> it, was danger, it was a thing the moment you said have, it. You know it. I have too many things I have to follow through on. <laughs> 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 is that the first rule? It is the first rule. <laughs> <laughs> you know, but, but like simple things like movie nights here are going to be far more accessible than they were at the old space. Yeah. Like just, just little things that will make this space more and more utilized. Summer, the, de- the dead of summer and the dead of winter are the toughest times I yeah. feel like yeah. that we've had. Yeah. Yeah. I remember. We never see membership dip during those times, but we definitely see utilization dip, which to me, like as an organization, does utilizations whatever because as long as people are still paying our dues, the, the organization is still going to live. But it makes me sad that people are like are paying for something that they're not using. Right. So no dedication. I, yeah. No dedication. 120 are, degree space. We, you should be there. If you are not negative wearing a five, coat, you should be there. If you're not wearing a winter coat, running a kerosene heater and have a hunting heater underneath you while you run a CNC router, you are not a maker. <laughs> All of those things Josh and I have done. But Josh, the laser doesn't run at 120 degrees Fahrenheit. I don't care. I ran a CNC <laughs> router. <in> the tube. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Certain tools don't work just as much as makers. Um, Jay, what do you got? Yeah, I'll just add on a little bit of what Christian said about the artists. Um, I'm a huge advocate for STEAM education rather than STEM education. What so, does that mean? Uh, you add the arts to the whole science, technology, engineering, and math thing, and um, that actually makes it meaningful. Um, Ouch. Yes. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Get wrecked. Before? No, no, and it's STEM engineering. It means that you don't really understand. You, don't, you know, you don't really don't understand how okay, it all works. Not understand. So um, what I like about the space, um, we're going to have a cleaner area, a place for more traditional arts. And I think the thing I'm most excited about is getting those people in here and then watching them transition over to the dirty side of the shop and learning stuff like CNC and the things we're going to have on the other side of the wall. But right now, people come into the current space and it's it's hard to, to take that creativity that you have in your head and get started. I think here there's going to be a, a, like a flashpoint for, for everybody who comes in. They know they'll, they'll be able to just start working on what their passion is and then grow into the other stuff. Well, and I like what you said there. Thank you. <laughs> don't, it, no, no, no. Don't Where, no, too much. No, I'm going, <laughs> I'm going to tickle enough. his ego a little bit here. <laughs> it's, the, it's the arts to sciences kind of like crossing that barrier, but it's the same way. Because like I myself was a huge, like I look at what, like where I was in like high school and things like that, which was a long time ago now. <laughs> but like I was a huge arts and I got into the maker science engineering side of things and it got so consumed that I got lost from the arts and I'd like to see myself go back there so it's like having tools more readily available and not just kind of like oh well when Jay's around they come out (laughs) and that's it and I like the idea that we're going to have potentially tools or capabilities that are going to be more readily available that I would potentially pick it back up again like Screen printing is a prime example of that. I loved doing that in high school. I still have a shirt that I screen printed in high school. I will I, never get rid of it. I would love to do a Why Steam over STEM episode. Yeah, oh, that would yeah, be, that'd really, be so fun. That'd be a great episode. I think it's really cool we because have Jay back on. We're, <laughs> we're already starting to get to the area where like artists are wanting to come through. We have our um, local Peoria Podcast Alliance who are already wanting to partner with us. Um, and come into the space and start hosting stuff with us. And I, I think it's it, the, the community is already there, and once we make the space, we're just going to be flooded by artists in order for them to come in and start creating. And so, I, personally, I am really excited for the future of the space and where I can see a lot of the stuff heading. Yep, I'm thrilled. Do we have anything else we want to talk about the new building? What do you mean? I don't know. I mean, we're just... Okay. Talking about that? new building stuff. Yep, this is Roger. Going to jump Welcome in here. Roger. Welcome, Roger. Welcome, Roger. Hey, it's Roger. So, Another member. <laughs> Long time listener, first time caller. You know. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm 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 super excited. One about the new space because there's no stairs. I don't have to bounce my knee up and down and 
you can't carry something up the stairs if you're trying to drag yourself up the stairs. <laughs> Especially so everybody's been track. kind enough to carry things down for me is much appreciated. But I think starting with an open box like this, it's just it's it's four walls. And we can do anything we want. We can be creative. We can do those things we'd like to do. And nobody's going to yell at us because they drilled into their brick. They're like, no, go ahead. <laughs> so I think that's going to open up our creativity a ton. And having an art space, uh, you know, having an electronics bench that I don't have to take the brick dust off every week is going to be great. Oh, yeah. I'm oh. really excited about that because now we can have an Arduino demo area, setup yeah. area. You know, we can have a working unit there and bring somebody in and say, okay, here's how you do it. And it's dedicated. And to me, that, that's kind of the dream I've got is to get that going and have that available and bring people in and introduce them to that and then get them hooked on what we do. Yeah. I want to yeah. see... I Thanks, Roger. Yep. I feel like this gets our original space that we were in, and I say our space, is our 100 to 400 migration that was our original space. Mm -hmm. And we did a lot more classes and a lot more, I'm going to say, outreach that was more organic than we do even today. And I feel like this space kind of lifts the shroud of constriction that I'm just going to say the space has had because of multiple floors things like well, that. I, th I think the big thing at, that enabled that at the old space was we always had a clean area to open up into because of the gallery space. Yeah. We, we were never constricted by our own clutter and crap that we are now. And and we've gotten a lot better about that. But I that was, that was a, a thing that we always had was we had a screen in one spot and we were always able to open up into the gallery space that had to be clean at the end of the night. Well, and, and I think part of it was also location was we, we would have people who were slightly intimidated to come to the location that we were previously at. Um, um, but I think now we are moving into a location that is going to be much more suited for a lot more people to be able to come in and a lot more friendly yeah. um, for uh, yeah. welcoming. Even 825 was, you know, it's only two blocks away, three, three blocks away. Three blocks. Yeah. But that the, that three blocks is like a wasteland. Yeah. That very much separates us from the rest of Peoria and it, downtown. Eighty five was the original makerspace building, right? Yeah. 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 And you know that building was tied to across the street was uh, Sugar, and next door to that was um, a small business building, but then. You know, in the same block was the uh, baseball field and a couple other businesses that always generated foot traffic for us. So uh, the foot traffic's not going to be much here, but what we will have is street signage. Yeah. We will have um, tons of traffic constantly. And we're in a part of town that people just, there isn't a stigma about. Well, and you, like 825 to, I hate to, like, this is not hate because I love it. But, like, we talk about industry, and we're like, oh, yeah, we're drinking industry tonight. But, like, it's crazy how much how much foot traffic was generated off of... Off of sugar. Sugar, and yeah. having yeah. beer readily available. And, you know... Sugar well, being the restaurant across the street. Yeah, we yeah, had, yeah. We had a, a, a wood-fired oh, pizza yeah. place right across the street that had street seating. And... Every week, we'd have people like, oh, I, I saw you guys over here making stuff while we were at Sugar. We just thought we'd come over and see what's going on. Every week. And that was huge. Uh, we got a lot of members out of that. We, we got donations out of that. Um, you know, just random people coming in. We had the CEO of Caterpillar come in one day. <laughs> former, former For, CEO. Former CEO. Well, now too former. But, but you know, it yeah. was... It was crazy uh, how much foot traffic we got out of just one pizza place that, you know, was admittedly delicious. Right. Yes. But uh, I do look forward to their burger and dollar beers on Tuesdays. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, we've got a few more minutes before we hit our normal time period. So uh, maybe we could go back and talk about our 
uh, favorite moments of growth um, during the last couple years of the makerspace. Uh, kind of commemorate 1213 and even 825 and um, our pain points. So things or- that got us here. Organizational growth or personal growth? Sure. Either or. What, whatever, whatever River City Labs maybe and maybe its location was involved in. Jason, so, I, yeah, sorry. I have to think. If we, if I need to edit some space out of this, that's fine. From the growth perspective, and ta- I, I say the, it's like eight twenty five to twelve thirteen, and even in twelve thirteen, like seeing that, like we we've actually been in two phases of twelve for thirteen. So we first started on the second floor. We were just on the second floor. And then we're like, oh, you know, we moved down to the first floor. But it's like we I saw the inception of 825 through the end of 825. And it was like amazingly exciting to be like, oh, we're upgrading and we're getting a bigger space. But it was like sometimes having the right space it shows really how much having the right space is important. And 1213 served our purposes for two years plus. But having the right space really makes a very important, it it makes it like an asset to a makerspace because it really does make or break a makerspace. And I think we're at the point where we're ready to have the right space again. And not the 1213 hasn't done us well it has it's, it's had its ups and downs but we are ready we've moved past that a while ago and now we're ready to move on and i'm glad to see we're kind of in that next phase of our lifespan so i've only been with the space for I don't know, about three years now has and it been three years it's i believe it so. felt like six <laughs> <laughs> in a good way. That's just because yeah. I talk a lot in <laughs> Slack. Joe's still number one in Slack. Yeah. yeah. Well, yeah. Of, of, of all time? Or? Of all time, so. Joe's still... check the last 30 days. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I, blew, I, I totally believe it. <laughs> so I've only been with the space for about uh, three month, three years or so. And we've only, I've only ever been with the, uh, the space while we've been at this uh, 1213, our current... I guess I guess we passed building now. We're, we're currently moving, but uh, I would say I mean I'm going to take this as more of a, a personal growth since being with the maker spaces. I went through a, a, a stint of my life last year where I got uh, I was laid off and I became unemployed, and I went through a whole good six months of depression. Of well, you know, in in, in our American culture, our identity is so heavily tied to our our profession or our occupation. To the point where if you don't have an occupation or you're not currently working you feel worthless and like well I don't currently do anything but you know what I kind of learned was well I, I identify more as, as a maker than what, whether, whatever my job is because you know at the end of the day I don't, I don't really want to work I just work to pay the bills and you know when I'm not working and not paying bills I am making things and I am you know helping run this maker space or I'm working on my own projects to improve myself in different, you know, makey things. And so now, so yeah, so now, you know, I, whenever I identify, whenever I, you know, introduce myself, I say, well, I'm, I'm, I consider myself a maker, but I also, you know, I'm a software engineer, you know, by day, maker by every other time. So uh, it, it'll be, it's, it's going to be hard leaving our old building just because so many memories of, of, of joining the space and, yeah, meeting all the people and, and learning all that stuff. It, it'll be hard to leave, but, you know, I've learned a lot in the past three years just by joining the makerspace and getting to know the people that I feel like I've personally just grown a lot as a person just being a part of it. So that's me. <laughs> yeah. So I, I don't think there's one singular event that I can think of um, as far as growth, but I think just seeing our history and knowing that we went from being that group that does 3D printing down in the warehouse <laughs> district to people actually saying, hey, you know, 
yeah, I, I know about you guys. I, I, I'm been meaning to stop in or whatever. Um, I think just that that transition to being a community asset, where everybody from economic development to you know the, the local museum to the arts partners uh, of Central Illinois to you know all the other groups that we work with the Children's Playhouse, um, you know they they respect us and we're, we are part of the community now. We're not just guys that do like one thing. We're, we are a community of people that that help advocate for the makers in this town. So and it's and it continues to grow. And I think um, this here will be more of a kind of a I don't know. It, it'll be another growth opportunity. It's time to step up. Now we got a great building. We're going to invite these groups into our space more than what we did in the past. And uh, you know, through them advocating for us even more, um, I, I, I see our our growth and our you know all individually and the space just is going insane like in the next year or two i think for me it's it's also on a personal note um i came into the maker space over uh four years ago when it was still at 825 and uh, i came in on a uh, 3d printer build uh and it was for a uh, modified wells bot taz um that we called the zat um and the zat took me um, about a year to build <laughs> uh, and actually get working and through that time um, the maker space has become something else for me um, and it's become a place where I've made for sure some lifelong friendships and just been able to talk to people that I never would have thought that I would have had that connection with um, and it's been awesome like this this has been an outlet where not only I've been able to be creative and a maker, but also make really good friends who have been able to help me out through things and also just step aside and go, hey, let's talk about the project you're working on. Um, and so I, I am excited for this next chapter in RCL's life um, and how it's continued to grow. And it's, I'm nothing but excited to see where it continues to go. So I too came for the, well, I was involved beforehand, but the Zat build was when I really got engaged. Uh, this is Ted again, by the way. Uh, Welcome so, back, Ted. <laughs> thank you, thank you. So the Zat build is what really engaged me, and I think how much of a challenge it was, really, I, I fed off of that, and that led to me being sure that I wanted to be an engineer. I ended up going through Bradley University, which is the local school and uh, for manufacturing engineering. So I started with the Zat build and then tackling all the problems with the Zat build and building out in my own way and doing modifications, really uh, kind of getting a handle on 3D modeling and then 3D printing and then um, tackling the CNC router at the makerspace, which is not great. Uh, so <laughs> I, 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 it, functions. <laughs> it functions. I started on that CNC router and then realized the limitations of it and what I couldn't do with it and ended up building my own from scratch. And so at that point, I really knew that engineering, manufacturing was a thing for me. And so River City Labs changed my life a lot in that way. It's Roger again. Welcome back, Roger. <laughs> I just want to point out something really interesting. I came to one thing at 825 years ago. Uh, Quinn Burkar invited me, then didn't show up. <laughs> but I felt these people were messing with 3D printers. And here's this guy, Ted who I helped babysit with his dad when I worked on his mom's <laughs> tape backup unit. And here he is grown and he's an engineer. And I'm like, this is so cool to see that. And I want to be part of this. It took me a little longer because I had to like get out of the workforce first. But I am <laughs> stoked and excited for what we're doing. And now having a 3D printer that actually functions Turn me loose, baby. Yeah. Uh, I should have gone first. Um, so, when we started this makerspace uh, years ago, I never expected anything like this. What we've, what was just explained, and what exists today to happen. I especially didn't expect to hit a point where we were talking about five years. Like, no. Uh, I was thinking like six, 
to eight months before we got bored and moved on and did something <laughs> else. <laughs> so, um, yeah, the the uh, the growth that this space has seen, and the engagement this space has seen, and the people that it has brought in have just uh, it, it's just blown me away constantly. And the fact that we're on location three potentially four if you count the first one twice and um you know we're we're looking at or at least fourth officer class in the next year uh and um everything that's happening it's it blows me away i i just i i can't wait to see what happens next um but it definitely wouldn't have happened had we not found um somebody who was willing to support us for as little money as we were able to pay and as uh, crazy as our dreams sounded back in the day um, when we found Colt. Uh, you know, the, the building has been frustrating, the building has been great, uh, and Colt has been frustrating, and Colt has been great. Colt is our landlord. But without him, we wouldn't have made it as far as we have. They say what you will that it is the truth so um you know everything lines up as it should and for a long time i jokingly but truthfully told people like if somebody wanted to give us a grant for twenty five thousand dollars today i i would tell them no and then not tell anybody that i did that because (laughs) It would compl- fundamentally, from the ground up, change the way the space operates and the people interact with each other, and you know everything. Um, and I don't want anything to change here other than we just continue on the trajectory that we're on. Natural, so. sustainable growth. Yeah. 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 So. Yep. I think with that, yeah, that's we're good. We're wrapped up. So uh, this was Joe, then Aaron. And Christian. And Josh. And Jay. And Roger. And Ted. And uh, thanks, guys. See ya. See you later. Have a great week. Bye.